Okay. Well, we Ready? Okay. So, tonight's lecture is part of the uh, event series of events organized by the Open University. I hope most of you know about the Open University, but if you don't, uh, the Open University is the UK's and the world's first university which is teaching by distance learning, particularly initially in the early days by the BBC. This year is a very special mark for the Open University because it is our 50th anniversary. So uh, we are holding a series of events, uh, all of which have a brand of the Open University at 50, and this is one of those events. Now, the Open University has amazingly actually um, taught and had almost 2 million students go through uh, various courses, and I believe we have some people here tonight who are still studying with the Open University. Uh, 157 different countries. Uh, it's a really impressive number, two million people from 157 countries. So we are in Cambridge, and Cambridge is famous, but the OU's reach is, is extremely large as well. Now, um, this meeting also uh, is the opportunity as part of the 100th anniversary of the International Astronomy Union. We've been holding a conference here this week as part of those celebrations, and we're talking about laboratory astrophysics, which is the title of it tonight. We're very lucky tonight that we have as our guest speaker, Dr. Hern Fraser from the Open University, a good colleague of mine for many years and a graduate of uh, this, this college, King's. She studied her PhD here. Also for the women in the room, it's very important that we engage and make sure that more women do science. So for the young women in the room, please think about doing science. And tonight you're going to have an extremely good example of a woman who has built a marvellous career and been done loads of interesting and exciting things and really is a leader in her field. So we're extremely lucky to have Helen here tonight. And I know you're going to have a very good talk because Helen always gives very good talks. And some of the videos you're going to see tonight do have a little bit of the wow factor. So I hope people online are also going to watch them and you'll have to play them back again when you go. So Helen, enormous pleasure to invite you to give your talk, which is going to be entitled Crash Diets or How to Build a Planet in 22 Seconds. Not 21, not 23, but in 22 seconds. Off you go. Thank you, Nigel, very, very much. Good evening. And uh, let me start by also saying a little hello to everybody who's online and uh, particularly people who might be watching in Greece at this moment. Okay, so I wonder why we're interested in planets. Luckily, we all live on a planet, we hope, we think. Uh, I don't think anyone disagrees with me. And one of the really interesting things about our planet is the wealth of different life we can find on it. These are some pictures of all different kinds of life I've been able to uh, identify uh, that I know about on this planet. There are some pretty exciting things. If I um, just take this uh, uh, laser pointer that everyone can also then see online, this is actually me here diving with some uh, oceanic reef tip sharks some years ago. But um, these things down here are Antarctic aquatic marine animals living in very dark, cold regions. Of course, things like bacteria and viruses, they're also forms of life. So it's kind of strange, isn't it, that when we start to think about life and talking about life on other planets, quite often our brains first think of this thing here. Luckily, I'm not going to talk about that tonight at all. But I am going to think about why we think planets are important and why it's important in our search for the origins of life. And there are kind of three things that we might think are important for life. One is an energy source. Now, our main energy source that we have here on the Earth is actually the sun. Um, for those of you who've been in Cambridge today, um, instead of it being freezing cold and minus degree temperatures like it was at the start of the week, today we could all put our shorts and t-shirt on and go sunbathing on the grass. It was that hot. And that just very small difference is related to um, our weather, but also how much of that energy from the sun is reaching us here on the Earth. 
The other thing that's really important to us is water. And of course, for us, the kind of water we think is really important is liquid water. We like to drink it. Actually, we quite like gaseous water. It ends up in, uh, in the upper atmosphere and then forms clouds and liquid droplets and it rains. Um, and also, we have snow and ice, so different forms of water. But liquid water is certainly very important to us. And you might think that oxygen was very important because all of you are sitting in this room and luckily still wide awake um, because you're breathing and got plenty of oxygen to, to do so with. But actually, oxygen isn't always the most important thing. There are plenty of species that don't really need oxygen to metabolize at all. So what we're hunting for when we're looking for planets that could sustain life is really energy sources and water, the two key ingredients we need. Now, we can't start talking about planets unless we know a little bit about star and planet formation. So let's say something about star and planet formation. The star formation cycle, what happens in the universe, is one of the biggest recycling projects we have anywhere in the world. In fact, anywhere in the universe. Because what happens is stars are born, and then they die, and then they're born again, and then they die. And in actual fact, our own sun is a third generation star. Okay, so before our star, in this kind of vicinity, this corner of the Milky Way, there was a star, and then it died, and another star, and it died. Not exactly here. And now we're on the third one. Now, that's kind of interesting, isn't it, you don't really think about it. Now, it doesn't really matter where I go in this star formation cycle to start, but I like to kind of start here because this is the bit that I do my research on, so this is the most important bit. Now, the astute amongst you will notice this very kind of peanut shape in my picture here. This is a, actually um, a molecular cloud. It's a cloud of gas and dust. And actually, this is a visible picture, and it's not that there are no stars, where my laser pointer now is. It's just that the dust, just like the smoke from a candle, is obscuring all the starlight from behind this cloud and scattering it so we can't see. And the Egyptians used to think that these were holes in the sky. And they used to think it's where rebirth happened. In that respect, they were quite true, because this is exactly where new stars form. This is a very famous picture from the Hubble, a um, picture from NASA, of um, one of the pillars of creation. And um, in this um, little image, you can see a huge amount of gas and dust. And if I were to put my laser pointer on one of these tiny areas, I'll put it there and then take it away again. My laser pointer is, is about uh, a thousand times, a thousand times, a thousand times bigger than the little tiny part of that cloud that is collapsing and beginning to form a star. So it's very easy to see a picture like this and not really understand the scale of what we're seeing because it's hard for our brains to imagine. But basically what happens is due to um, gravitational collapse, these clouds start to collapse under their own gravity and at the centre we start to form a star. And when that happens, we have something which is a very technical term. It's called conservation of angular momentum. What it basically means is you've probably learned at school energy can't really be created or destroyed. So we have to make all the energy balance out as this cloud is collapsing and we're forming a star. And what happens is we end up forming disks. And this is a picture in the Orion Nebula of some of these disks around stars. And of course, unfortunately for us, when we're observing as observational astronomers, we don't always have a very, what we call, beautiful line of sight. So these disks could be face on, so they could be like the palm of my hand, or they could be edge on, or they could be slightly tilted on, and all different shapes. And as astronomers, we have to work out what those different shapes mean. But it's inside these disks that this really amazing thing happens almost certainly as a continual byproduct of star formation, planet formation. And it's at this point where we form planets that we could potentially get the formation of life. Now, I'm going to skip forward very quickly, and I don't want anyone to be worried, because it's about six million years to billion years before it's going to happen to our sun. Um, but eventually a star dies. And when a star dies, it sort of destroys everything in its environment and kicks all the material out, and it forms a planetary nebula. We refuel the interstellar medium and start all over again. So we go all the way through this. Now, in that, I've just got rid of about 50% of an astronomy textbook. I'm not worried about it. But that's because tonight, I'm really going to focus on these three areas, these pre-stellar cores, these young stellar objects, the collapsing cores, the regions where planets are going to form. 
Okay. Now, I talked just a moment ago about water being vital for the origins of life. And what's very interesting about water is, in a way, we know here on Earth, it can be solid, liquid, or gas. And that's true in space as well. But in actual fact, in most of space, we don't have any liquid water at all. Unfortunately, no swimming pools, no drinking cups. Really, the water in the space between the stars in interstellar space where stars and planets are forming, that's just a solid or a gas. And it's only when we have a planetary surface or a planetary um, environment or an atmosphere that we're able to also have water. And at that point, we add water to the mix, we can have biology happening, geology, all sorts of different processes that can really start to change the chemistries, the biochemistries, the potential origins of life that we're seeing. So, the good news is we know at least one solar system exists, our own solar system. It has eight planets. The IAU were the very important people who decided Pluto wasn't a planet and demoted it. It was probably the first time many people in the world even heard of the IAU. But actually, there's a good reason for this, and that's because there are lots and lots of bodies a little bit like Pluto orbiting in that kind of region. Um, and in actual fact, now we know many, many different bodies in that part of our solar system. So we're not going to worry about those for tonight, but we're going to worry about the eight planets we do have. And they can be easily divided up into rocky terrestrial planets or gas giant planets. And there's a huge difference. Just look at this scale on the slide in front of you, how tiny the third rock from the sun, the Earth, really is in comparison to the enormity of the gas giant planets. And this doesn't even begin to show us the scale of how far away those planets are from the sun. So we certainly know that we have multiple planets that can be formed in a disk around a star. In actual fact, to date, and I checked this evening at 6 o'clock, the latest number, we have 3,940 plus 8 potential confirmed planets, exoplanets, planets outside our own solar system. So that's a pretty large number. We have 2,751 star planet systems. Now, I can see some of you thinking, why are you talking about that? Well, what that means is there's a very large number of multiple planet systems. But just unfortunately, you can't do 3,940 3, minus 2,751 and get the number of multiple planet systems. Why not? Because some multiple planet systems have two planets, some have three, some have four, some have five, some have seven. And so unfortunately, it's quite difficult to understand. But basically, what this means is I'm going to spend about an hour talking to you. And in that time, in the universe, we will have made about one million new solar systems. That's a pretty mind-blowing fact, isn't it, when we start to think about how else life might evolve on other planets. Now, when we start thinking about planets, we also need to think about not just if the planet is the right you know, exists, but we also need to think if it's the right kind of planet that potentially life could evolve on. Where do we find that life is on a planet? So we have to think of something called the Goldilocks zone. And all of you, hopefully, who have grown up, especially those of you watching online in the English-speaking world, will have probably heard the story of Goldilocks. And my figure kind of shows we need somewhere that's not too hot, not too cold, and just kind of about right, just like the porridge had to be for Goldilocks when she went into the three bears' house. So we know that if we go to a place that's too hot, it feels very uncomfortable and not very nice, pretty hard to live if it's too cold. As humans, we adapt. We use various different um, things from the world around us to, to survive. But in actual fact, most animals don't do that. Very few animals live over such a wide variety of temperature ranges as compared to humans. So we know that most things will require us to have just kind of the right temperature. Now, the other interesting thing about this is this Goldilocks zone is not a particular distance from the star to a planet because we have lots of different kinds of stars in the sky, hotter stars, cooler stars, bigger stars, smaller stars. And depending on what kind of star we are looking at, this Goldilocks zone, this really wonderful, not too hot, not too cold place, could be further away from a star or closer into a star. 
And yet we found around 347 of these exoplanets. That's a very exact number, isn't it? 347. Again, a number I looked up at 6 o'clock to double check because I had about 300 and it's gone up by 47 since I last gave this talk. 347 planets which are in this sort of crucial Goldilocks zone. And what's really interesting is this is just a, another figure to sort of show this, but you can see now, depending on how big the, the, the star is, how many solar masses, how big it is, just read that as how big it is, depends on how far away from the sun in distances of Earth-Sun units, one AU is an Earth-Sun unit, so here's the Earth, okay? It shows you where the habitable zone is. So interestingly, if we have stars smaller than the sun, the habitable zone could be closer in. And if we have stars bigger than the sun, it'll be further out. Now, unfortunately, this isn't the only part of the problem because now it gets even more complicated again. Scientists don't ever make things easy, do they? Ah, so I want to talk to you about the closest ever potential habitable planet that was discovered to Earth. And it, is, it was discovered around this object here, Proxima, the star Proxima, if you can just see this here, okay, which is uh, not far away from Centaurus, and for those who know it, the, the Crux, or the Southern Cross. And it was discovered by a European telescope, um, and potentially is, um, is a planet known as Proxima b, quite close to Earth. Now, this is not a picture of Proxima b. This is an artist's impression of what it might be like on the surface of Proxima b makes it look not too uninhabitable. The unfortunate thing is the type of star that Proxima b, was, the planet Proxima b was found around, has a huge radiation field. So what's actually happening is this surface is being bombarded with very high energy, electrons, x-rays, radiation. So to be perfectly frank, you would probably get fried on the surface or get some pretty horrible disease or get burnt skin or something pretty nasty in a very short period of time. And we're not really sure that even microbial life or bacterial life or anything could really live on this surface. It's a very hostile place. So the reality is we also have to think about whether the planets we're looking for, it's easy to go and collect planets, we have to think about what kind of planet they actually are and whether they have a kind of place that could not only hold water but could also hold life. So we know about lots and lots of different kinds of exoplanets actually. Unsurprising, there are eight different planets in our solar system and no two are the same. We know that we have um, hot Jupiters, lots of hot Jupiters have been found. And we know that we have cold gas giants, a little bit like um, uh, uh, moving towards Uranus and Neptune, but they're more icy giants. That's what we have here, icy giants. And perhaps planets with ocean worlds. We're a kind of ocean world planet, a rocky planet with an ocean world, and rocky planets and lava worlds. So we have all these different kind of planets, and we think that that's probably where life is. But that comes back to the question, how on earth do these planets form? How do we form a planet? Because if we can't form a planet, well, we do form a planet. I'm pretty certain I'm standing on one, so I'm pretty certain we formed a planet. So the question is, how do we form a planet? And to understand how we form a planet, we have to look inside these disks that we're interested in. Let me just um, kickstart this video here. There we go. So this is a little video that you're seeing on the screen now, which is a little animation of um, a baby star or a protostar at the centre of one of these dusty disks. And we're going to zoom in and we're going to see all the dust sticking and aggregating together in the centre of the disk and eventually forming a small rocky object which is going to go round and round and round uh, the star. So this is a kind of picture of star formation. Let me just play it one more time so that everyone can see it again. Okay, so here it is, one of those disks, slightly edge-on disk, like I showed you at the beginning of the talk, with a star in the middle. And what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in, we're going to have a look at that dust, and we're going to see that dust sticking and aggregating together and forming a planet. Now, if I just take a side cut through there, and we have a look um, here at uh, this picture at the top, 
then basically what I've got is I've got here the central star and gradually as I go out from the star looking along the side of the disk, so sort of looking along in this direction, I've got a region where I can stick rocky things together and then I have what I call a snow line. That's the point where it gets so cold, I've travelled far enough away from the, from the star that actually I start to sticking icy rocks together instead of just plain rocks together. And the, tra the interesting thing about this snow line or this frost line is that it gets even more complicated when we start looking at planet formation. Planets can form inside the snow line and migrate outwards, outside and migrate inwards. They can go a little bit backwards and forwards. There's a lot of turbulent mixing in these disks and it gets super, super complicated. So how on earth are we going to work out how we make an exoplanet, how we make a planet? Well, the first thing is I've just introduced quite a complex idea all about how we, uh, whether or not we understand that there's ice in space. So you might ask yourself, how do I know that there's definitely ice in space? So this is an image that was taken with the Spitzer Space Telescope. Um, that was an infrared telescope. It's known as the Mountains of Creation because the, all the scientists that worked on Spitzer didn't want to be outdone by Hubble who had the Pillars of Creation. So here we have some Mountains of Creation. But it's really interesting. This is looking deep inside. Do you remember earlier on that little peanut I showed you that we couldn't see the stars through? Now, now we're looking in the infrared. It's like we've put heat glasses on. So we're looking into the cold regions where these stars and planets are forming. And what's really interesting is the conditions in these regions. Now, the temperature in these regions that we're looking at is 10 degrees Kelvin. That's minus 263 degrees centigrade. That is very cold. Very, very cold indeed. Colder than the freezer. And the pressure is 18 orders of magnitude lower than the pressure here on the Earth. Now, that's pretty hard to do, so I wrote the number out with all the correct number of zeros. That's a very tiny, tiny number. Now, in these regions, which I think you'll agree are not very like the conditions in this room, it's much colder and it's much more rarefied gas. In actual fact, we found around 200 different, slightly more than 200, I looked that up at 6 o'clock as well to check, 209, it was 208 yesterday, it was 209 today, 209 different chemicals in these space regions. And 62 of these molecules, these chemicals, have been found in what are called extragalactic regions, other galaxies. Now, we haven't even started looking for planets in other galaxies yet. That's beyond our telescopic capabilities at this time. But we can already find similar ingredients to the ingredients we find in our own galaxy. So we're starting to realize our Earth may be not that exceptional. Our Milky Way is not that exceptional. Other stars in our Milky Way are quite like our star. Oh, my goodness, other galaxies are quite like our galaxy. It's pretty amazing when we start to think of how we sit there in the universe. But some of these chemicals that we find very commonly in space um, are the ones you might have heard of before. Carbon monoxide, that's the one that you have, I hope, an alarm on your wall so that you're checking carefully that your boiler is working well. Hydrogen gas, uh, carbon dioxide, we don't want too much of that in the room. Um, water, methanol and ethanol, some of you may partake of that occasionally. Um, Hopefully not the methanol, though. That's not so good for you, no. <laughs> um, and today, um, if you look in nature, there was a report of the first detection of the rather exotic-looking molecule, helium H+, which um, has been detected for the very first time in one of these star-forming clouds. We've detected it in other places. And what's really, really interesting to me is when I was a PhD student here, I remember being at a conference where the very first laboratory measurements of the spectroscopy of helium H plus were reported. And so now um, that's come full circle already, literally today in my career. It wasn't me that did that, but it was um, people I knew. And today, some astronomers have found helium H plus in, in stellar space. So now, I, I still haven't answered the question, how do we know there's ice in space, have I? I've told you we know there's loads of molecules. And you're probably thinking, how do you know there's loads of molecules? How do you observe interstellar molecules? Now, it might come as a little bit of a surprise because what you often see in the literature is an awful lot of beautiful pictures, stunning pictures. And those of you in the audience that are really into astrophotography, I salute you because you have to have a lot of patience and the pictures are very beautiful. 
But actually, most modern astronomy doesn't really look at images and pictures at all. What we use is we use a technique called spectroscopy. Now, what on earth is this spectroscopy thing, apart from a big word that's hard to say? Well, we take our telescope, and let me just, for those online, make sure that you can see the pointer. So we take our telescope, which might be on an aeroplane or in space or on the ground, and we look at the light from stars nearby or from inside a star in a cloud, and we look at that light as it lands on the Earth or comes to the Earth. It doesn't land, it comes to the Earth. And, and against it, we see the spectrum of the star, and against it, we see all these funny dip bits. And these funny dip bits are different wavelengths of the light, different frequencies of the light, are actually very specific and can tell us all about the different chemicals, the atoms and molecules that are in that line of sight between us and the object we're looking at. And so what we're really interested in looking at is something called molecular motion. So I'm just going to do a bit of physics for a minute. So you thought you were coming to do astronomy. We've done a bit of chemistry. We're now going to do a bit of physics. I'm going to stop at those three sciences today, though. Um, so here I have a little picture of the, um, the electromagnetic um, spectrum. Now, we are all used to the electromagnetic spectrum because our eyes work here in the visible part of the spectrum, where we can see the rainbow colours if we were to split them with a prism. But actually, you've met probably a lot of these things. If you've got a microwave oven, you, you know that microwaves exist. If you listen to a, a radio station, you know that radio waves exist. Um, if you go on holiday, um, you know that you need to put sun cream on to protect yourself from ultraviolet radiation. But if, like me, you've occasionally broken a limb or something else, you've probably been to the hospital and experienced some X-ray radiation or a dentist or something. And all of these forms of radiation, our electromagnetic radiation, are all very similar to light. And what we can do is when we look in different parts of this electromagnetic spectrum at what molecules are doing, we can start to see different kinds of motion of the molecules. And for us in astronomy, there are three key things that we're most interested in. One is the how the electrons within the atoms are moving. That's not so important for what we're going to talk about today. The other two things are molecular rotation and molecular vibration. Now, the challenge here is this is very difficult to demonstrate, so I'm going to come out here and I'm going to come and become a water molecule. So I want you to imagine, okay, that I am a water molecule. Um, and water has the chemical symbol H2O. So it has two hydrogens, they're going to be in my hands, and an oxygen, that's going to be my head. So a water molecule is slightly bent. It has this kind of shape. Okay, and so a water molecule can move in very many different ways. And when it's vibrating, it can do what's called a symmetric vibration, which goes like this. Okay, so I'm a water molecule doing symmetric vibration. Or I can be a water molecule doing an asymmetric vibration, like this. Or I can be a water molecule doing a bending mode vibration, which goes like this. And the trouble is that the amount of energy it takes for a water molecule to go like this, or like this, or like this, is different for each motion. Now, the other problem is that actually a water molecule doesn't say nice and still on the spot like me, but it does something extra complicated. So let's just do bending vibration because I can coordinate that one best. And in actual fact, as it's bending, the water molecule rotates. And in actual fact, the water molecule is so annoying that it rotates a bit while it's doing a, a kind of a, a vibration like this, and then it gets a bit like this, and eventually it's dancing. No, it stops. <laughs> OK, so this is what the water molecule does. Now then, what does that look like, really? because really I'm a spectroscopist. So what that means is that when we look at the wavelength of infrared light that's coming into our telescope, we can see different dips in that light, depending on whether the molecule, here is that asymmetric stretch, that was the one like this, or the symmetric stretch, which is the one like this, or the bending mode, which is the one like this. And so what we're able to do is at very specific wavelengths, we can not only see which molecule we've got, but we can even see how it's moving. And the reality is when we look with our telescope, oh, I'm stuck, have we crashed? No, there we go. 
Wonderful. Um, when we look with our telescope, we can actually see a really complicated wealth of different molecules. So it, these are all spectra of regions where stars are forming. And I've put all the chemical symbols on, but for those of you who aren't chemists, you can see some methanol, some water, some carbon dioxide, some carbon monoxide, maybe some ammonia, some formic acid, lots and lots of different chemicals we're used to seeing. And we're seeing those, and in this case, icy material, solid material. And we know that because the lines are, the lines are very broad, and we know that from what we understand about spectroscopy. So the key to planet formation, we absolutely know, is water ice and dust. And the dust that we form this water ice on looks rather like this. Now, this is an interplanetary dust particle, and it's an um, electron microscope image, so it's been blown up many, many times. But you'll see it's not like a little speck of dust. It's a very complicated structure. And so this is where, eventually, the formation of planets starts from. So let's have a look at this question of the role of ice in star and planet formation. Now, I'm going to prove to you all right now, with a little tiny experiment, that you're smarter than any astronomer currently living. OK? So here are some pictures of a beach. Different pictures, different beaches, tiny, tiny grains of sand. These tiny grains of sand on a beach are pretty similar, not quite the same, but pretty similar. They're made of the same type of material, same type of size as the tiny grains that we have in one of those big rings of dust that's going around a newly forming star. When you go to the beach, okay, and I want the audience just that's here, not to shout out, but just put your hand up. Do you go to the very, very top of the sand dune if you want to build your sandcastles, or do you go quite close to the waves and the sea? If you're going to go quite close to the waves and the sea, put your hands up in the air. Oh, phew. Right, those of you online, I hope that you did the same exercise. Everyone in the room here put their hand up. And that's absolutely true. If we want to form a sandcastle, you all know, you're all really smart, you know you can only get the sand to stick together if it's a bit wet. Now, isn't that interesting? Because astronomers seem to think we just five or six slides ago had a pretty picture of one of these disks. And I said to you, it's all full of this dusty stuff. It's these little tiny silicate grains. And they collide, and they stick together, and they grow bigger and bigger and form a planet. But step one, getting one tiny sand grain to stick to another tiny sand grain, you knew wouldn't work. So why did the astronomers think it would work? And we've got no liquid water in this part of space, so we can't even go to find a slightly wet bit to start to build a sandcastle to somehow move forward with. OK, so let's have a different solution. Well, how about snow? OK, we all know that we can build snowmen with snow, especially if we live in the United Kingdom. We also know that if we're very lucky and we go skiing or something, we can go somewhere and we can go snowboarding through powder snow. We might have seen it on the Olympics or we might have actually experienced it ourselves. Now, that's strange, isn't it? Because on the one hand, we can stick snow together and build something. And on the other hand, it doesn't stick together at all. In actual fact, once we hit a temperature of about minus 7 degrees centigrade, the outer layers of the snow, the ice in the snow, is so cold that the process of surface melting that enables us to stick snow together and ice cubes together and pack it all up and make a snowman just doesn't work anymore. And you might have experienced this. And for the children in the audience, be ready to tell your parents next time it snows. Um, it's really important to not go in the snow when it's too cold and try and build a snowman. You can roll and roll and roll the snow, and it'll just keep falling apart. It won't stick together. And this is, again, to do with all the properties of the snow and ice. So here we are. I said, oh, yes, the, the snowy, icy particles in space stick together and form a planet, and the sandy particles stick together. But actually, we know that that can't be true. So how on earth can we build a planet? Well, perhaps these icy grains really are the key. And what I've got here is a little movie. It's the same star again and the same... Uh, um, uh, 
uh, protoplanetary disk. But this time what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in and we're going to see um, ice growing on one of these grains. So we're going to get an icy grain. It's going to get all iced up. It's going to stick to other grains. Keep going, sticking and sticking. And it's going to build something bigger and bigger. This is what we must think happens somewhere along the way. And then it's eventually going to form what we call a cometary nucleus, the core of a comet. And eventually this comet is going to be traveling around this newly forming star. And eventually we'll see that this comet has a tail and it's outgassing and giving off the excess ice and everything else. Now, this is a beautiful picture, but it really doesn't work. We really don't know exactly how icy grains stick. And that's where I do my research. So, what do we already know? So here's a little picture up here. I'll use the pointer again for those of you online, which says, small things get to bigger things, get to bigger things. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. In actual fact, what we have is we have a real conundrum. When we have very, very tiny things that are up to about millimeter sized, so as small as your human hair, all the way up to about a millimeter size, actually they can stick together. Very tiny things can stick together. They're held together by a clever force called the Van der Waals force. And luckily, when we have very big things, it's back to this chicken and egg problem, like kilometer sized things, they can collide and stick together and gravitational forces come into play. It's just this big gap in the middle, which is somewhere between a millimetre and a kilometre. Not that much difference, is there really, between a millimetre and a kilometre, um, where we have a real problem. So what we do there is we have a look at how particles stick and interact, and some of them stick, and some of them bounce, and some of them fragment. So what I do with uh, my band of uh, healthy researchers, who for those of you in the room are in the front row, um, is we go um, and take our particle bashing experiment into a parabolic flight or a vomit comet. And we try and work out how these particles are sticking. And what happens is if we run these experiments um, at a 1G in the lab, so if you look very carefully at this, this picture here, here we have a very small target and we're trying to send a particle to stick on this target. This particle is moving at just a few centimetres per second. So a few centimetres per second, I would say, if you were swimming in a 25 metre swimming pool, one length, and having a really, really good gossip with whoever was swimming with you so that you were going really, really slowly, it would take you about 45 minutes to swim one length of the pool if you were traveling as slowly as this particle here. So this particle is traveling super slowly. So unfortunately, what happens when we do the experiment in the lab is the particle sediments. Can you see it here? It falls down before it can hit the target. On the other hand, when we work at zero G, let's just set that going again, we can actually push the particles towards the, the target and they can collide with the target and we can see what happens. Now, Unfortunately, not really sticking, but at least we can see what happens. So this is the reason why we go in a parabolic flight. It's not because there's very low gravity in a, a protoplanetary disk or anything else. It's simply because if I throw something, and I, I thought about it, and then I realized that probably throwing this across the room wasn't a good idea. But if I throw something, um, maybe I hope the camera can see me, but say if I throw this cup, it doesn't keep traveling in a straight line, does it? If I throw it, it eventually falls down. And it falls down because here on Earth we have gravity and the gravitational force is acting towards the center of the Earth. I better not leave it as a mess, I'll put it back over here. So what we have to do is we have to go in a parabolic flight where we try and balance all the forces and counteract gravity so that we don't get this falling down effect that you see in my videos here. Okay, so what kind of machine do we use for particle bashing? It is actually quite a complicated machine. I'm not going to talk about all the ins and outs of it, but there is a lot of engineering involved. And all I want to show you with these pictures is that there's a lot of information goes into trying to very simply take two little pieces of sandy or icy material and push them together very slowly and watch what happens. That seems like a simple experiment, doesn't it? But um, probably costs about half a million pounds to have this experiment. And yesterday, where you're all sitting, um, we had an outreach afternoon and there were around 100 school kids actually playing with this experiment here in this room. So it was pretty exciting. 
Okay, so how does the parabolic flight work? Well, here are some pictures of me some years ago now in a parabolic flight. We go off to um, Bordeaux in France, and basically they take um, an airplane, uh, roughly an A320, and as this little animation from Novaspas, the people who run the plane, shows, basically what happens is they bank the plane up really, really high. They bank it up to an angle of around uh, 50 degrees, 40 to 50 degrees, and then they start to fly um, following a very small curvature of the Earth, a parabola. So it's not that they drop the plane down and that's when we're in free fall. It really is a balancing of all the forces, the thrust, the drag, the lift, and the gravitational force. So that in the frame of reference inside the aeroplane, it feels like gravity has been switched off. It feels like zero G. Of course, we still have a gravitational force acting. And what basically happens is we go through this 22 seconds... Now you see where the 22 and not the 21 or the 23 comes from. And it has to be 22 seconds, because if it were 21 or 23, then the pilots might have done something a little bit wrong and we're in a little bit of trouble. So it really does have to be 22 seconds. Um, where we basically go through a cycle, I'm going to um, play this video one more time. I think I can do that. Let's just see. Oh, let me just turn there. There's a pointer off, I should be able to play this video one more time. Now, what you can do very carefully when you're watching this video, if you would like to, is on this side here, you can actually see what the g-force is. So it's gone from one to two. So twice the acceleration due to gravity. So the unfortunate thing is for 22 seconds of feeling weightless and not weighing anything at all, ladies particularly, you first have to go through about a minute and a half of weighing twice as much as usual. So not quite the crash diet you were hoping for. And as you come out of your parabola, you weigh twice as much as usual and then you go back to your normal weight. So it really is a bit like a crash diet. It doesn't work very well at all. Now, when we go in the aeroplane, we do this 22-second parabola 31 times in a flight. Flights are quite good fun because the first thing they do, and for the young children in the audience, they do it under a very controlled fashion with a doctor, is they give you a drug. And they give you a drug to make sure you're not sick because this is like being on a roller coaster for four hours without getting off. So it can make you feel quite ill. Um, the, the drug they give you is called scopolamine, and it says do not operate machinery, do not do anything which involves concentration. Um, so you're really in an unfortunate situation. It's also a diuretic, so it makes you need the toilet. But if you're going to be on an aeroplane which has a zero-G phase, if you had a toilet, then as you went into zero-G, all the water and things would come floating up. So there's no toilet on the aeroplane. So I shall leave you to think about how that is and how we manage, but we do manage. Okay, would you like to see what it looks like to be inside the aeroplane while we're doing this kind of flight? my hair flying out a little bit. If you look down the plane, you'll suddenly realize there are people Working. at the ceiling. So obviously, let me press pause. Obviously, I'm not quite the world's best cameraman when I'm holding a mobile phone and floating around in zero G. But 
What's really interesting about that is it, it makes you realize the environment you're doing your experiments in, right? This is for the sake of science. It looks a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. But actually, you have to get your science done because you only kind of get one shot at being in the plane for a whole day to get your data done before the next day. And actually, what you could hear, I hope, when you were on that video, and I'm going to show you another one in the moment, so listen out. You hear the quite noisy environment of an aeroplane, which you're maybe used to if you fly on an aeroplane, and then you really hear the plane throttling back. You really hear that it, it, it's changing how the engines are, the thrust is changing. And in actual fact, um, I, I have also flown in the cockpit when we've had um, parabolic flights, and all the alarms are going off, all the stall alarms and the um, proximity alarms. And actually what you see as a pilot is you sort of see the sky, and then uh, you see the sea, usually we're over the sea, and then you see the horizon. So as we go through the parabola, the pirate, the, the pirates, no, they're no pirates, the pilot's view is, um, is uh, really um, quite um, interesting. So now I have another picture. That was me having fun because basically we'd done the experiment so efficiently that we were having a little bit of floating around time. But you see that the time I was actually floating around for was pretty short, right? 22 seconds. You can also hear very carefully that the pilot from the cockpit counts you into, he counts 30, 40 injection. That's what he says. Actually, he says it in a beautiful French accent, um, uh, saying 30, 40 injection, which is really much nicer when you're feeling tired of doing your experiments. And then you know that you're going to be in zero G. And then he will count you out as well. So he'll say 40, 30, pull up. And pull up is also because they're talking to themselves to make sure they're flying the parabola correctly. But it's also there so that we know as experimenters where we are in the cycle of the 2G, 0G, 1G. Um, so what I'm going to show you now is I'm going to show you us actually doing the experiment. So now you will hear us communicating. It takes three people to run our experiment once we've had the drugs and we're in the middle of the aeroplane. And um, I'll just stay quiet for a moment. There we go. Lovely. Thank you. So what's really interesting, what you see there, when you've only got 22 seconds, you really have to work as a team. I think it's a really nice way to demonstrate how important it is when you're doing science experiments, you work as a team. You could hear us all constantly communicating with each other how we were going to do the experiment so we could get the data. So you have to be really, really focused, and it takes quite a lot of planning. Now, what I'm going to show you just in the last sort of uh, five or ten minutes is, is actually then what happens. Uh, oh, there we go. Let me. What do the particles look like that we collide? Well, the particles we've been trying to collide have been icy balls. So these are the little icy balls. We make them by um, dropping little drops of water into liquid nitrogen. These are crystalline ice balls, so they're a little bit like the um, kind of ice you find in your freezer. And there's a little ruler at the bottom there, so you can see they're about half a centimetre wide. And we put those into our experiment, and we push them together with the pistons at the very slow speeds, um, and we have them in a vacuum, and they're very cold, about minus 250 degrees centigrade or so, and then we see what happens. So let's see what happens. Oh, dear. I think, unequivocally, you can see there, they didn't stick. So we've just done 45 minutes of talking all about how to build a planet, and at the first stage of actually trying to recreate conditions, unfortunately, they didn't stick. So maybe we thought, well, maybe it's just a nice problem. Maybe we can just um, get some dust and try and stick that together. Maybe some cold dust will stick together. So we have uh, the same experiment. We put some very cold dust in it. It's a very low temperature. Um, oh, this one. Let's see if I can get this one to play again. Let me take the laser pointer off. Ah, oh, yes, there we go. Um, 
And, uh, oh, I have to keep playing that one. It's not on a loop somehow. There we go. Oh, no, it doesn't want to play again. Um, but we can see that there is, um, there is dust and it's also not sticking. So unfortunately, what we discovered was that the ice bounces. Sometimes it even shatters into many, many pieces. What's also interesting, though, is that these balls of ice, which are traveling towards each other, if you look very carefully now, you have to be very astute, but you look very carefully, very often what's happening is they travel towards each other and they bounce. But after they bounce, they start rotating. So we change what kind of energy is in the, in the, in the translational motion. From the motion of the particles, they start rotating. And we see lots and lots of rotation. That's pretty hard to see in a video, actually. So I have a kind of motion stop for you here. So let me just show you in this motion stop, and I'll use again the laser pointer so that those online can see. But if you see, here are the particles traveling towards each other, and here are the particles traveling away from each other again. There's some nice spherical ice particles bouncing towards and away. And here is the same thing. And it's much easier to see in this picture because these are non-spherical particles. This is crushed ice. But you can see the particles, after they bounce away from each other, they really start turning around. And even though our particles are not sticking, what's really interesting is we can actually use this information. This we were the very first ones to understand that this change in information happened. We can use this information to actually think about what's happening in one of these protoplanetary disks, these planet-forming disks. And really, traffic jams are the key to the solution. So who would have imagined, I was talking to someone in the audience tonight who came from Peterborough and had a very difficult time in a traffic jam. Uh, whenever I have to travel for work, I often experience this feeling on the M25 when I'm driving home from Heathrow. Um, but traffic jams really are the key. And I have a little animation here. I want you to watch the red car. The red car changes lanes. You know all this thing about smart ways where you're not changing lanes and traffic jams? This is actually what shows you what happens. Because basically, as one car changes lanes, great for the red car, all the other cars behind start breaking. And you get a knock-on effect. Now, in actual fact, I do appreciate that really collisions that are going to build planets are a bit more like crashes than somebody changing lanes. But I didn't feel I wanted to show you a car crash simulation, so I'm just showing you a changing lane simulation. But this changing lane simulation, let me try and run it one more time for you, just so I'm talking about it. There we go. This is really what's happening to these icy particles. These icy particles are colliding and slowing down and rotating. And so the faster moving particles crash into them from behind. And then that slows down other ones and other ones. And this is something scientists gave a posh name to. It's called a streaming instability. Streaming instabilities are found in a lot of different places. It's to do with hydrodynamics. Oh my gosh, another piece of physics we're having to involve in building uh, planets. And this is a little simulation from Jake Simon, which is showing how, because the gas and the dust and the material in a disk is all moving at slightly different velocities, they start shearing past each other. Different pieces of the material in one of those big disks is starting to shear past each other, and you get buildup of density in certain places. And once you've got a lot of high density, you can start to push material together and build it up. So even though the collisions in this sort of millimeter to kilometer size range aren't sticking, colliding, and building things, what they are doing is they're changing the velocity of one component of the material in a protoplanetary disk so that you can build up these streaming instabilities and start building planets. Now, what's really amazing about all of what I've told you here is actually we now have quite a lot of observational evidence that all of this story comes together and is probably true. So first of all, we can see, as is shown in this uh, first set of pictures here, that in many places in disks, we can see, um, so this is an image from Alma, and this is um, a picture of clumping of dust at the center of a disk. So here's a disk. There's the central star down here. And all this bright stuff here is where the dust is clumping together, somehow starting to stick together. This is also a composite image up here of micron-sized dust. That's dust that's really smaller than a human hair in, in, its, in its width. And millimeter-sized dust, and showing that we can have different sizes of dust in different parts of a protoplanetary disk. And once we've got that evidence, then we can start to understand how these streaming instabilities happen. What we also have is we have evidence of snow lines in disks. Remember right at the beginning when I said dusty things collide together and then they form a planet that migrates out and icy things 
clamp together and migrate in, and we have what we call a frost or a snow line. These are images, beautiful, beautiful images, where the arrow is pointing to, which are imaging snow lines in these disks. Pretty exciting. And finally, you've probably seen all the beautiful pictures from missions, and those of you who joined us for our lecture on Tuesday or have watched online will have seen um, Kimberly talk quite a lot about Pluto and the New Horizons mission, and also Rosetta, the mission to land on a comet. So the question I started asking this evening was, how do we build a planet? And the answer is, it's not that simple at all. So whilst we're going in this hunt for life and working out where life might exist in the universe, actually, even the simple process of building the home for that life to live on is not something simple. It's quite complicated. It involves a lot of physics. So the next time you hear about an exoplanet, you can start thinking about how complicated that really is. I want to summarize by telling you, really, that we talked about how when you collide things together, they can bounce, stick, and fragment. In actual fact, a traffic jam is probably key to what's going on. And really, it's this combination of the collisions and streaming instabilities that eventually leads to forming those kilometer-sized bodies that can go on and form the really, really big planets. But I can't really finish without really coming back to the very interesting question of life. And what's amazing, actually, is when we look at the composition of the interstellar space or the regions where these planets are forming, and if we just look at the elemental analysis and compare it to the biosphere of the Earth, so not the whole of the Earth, not to the centre, but the region where we know life probably exists, my pie charts here on the right-hand side show that the percentages or the amounts of hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen are remarkably similar in both cases. And that's not surprising really at all, because every atom in your body, every atom in this room, every element that's around us eventually, all originated from stars. But isn't it interesting that whilst we're really, really busy looking up with our telescopes and seeing interesting things, we're also looking down and trying to see the same thing. And that's what this week here in Cambridge has been all about for us. And it's been an absolute privilege to share some laboratory astrophysics with all of you here and all of you online. And I just want to finish by saying interstellar gas and dust is the stuff that new stars and planets, which are the byproducts of star formation, are made of. And all of us are part of this universe. Thank you very much. So I just want to say to those of you online, we're going to leave you in a moment. But if uh, you would like to know a little bit more, about star and planet formation, then please follow the links that are given here to um, OpenLearn and come and join us at the Open University to study for a BOC or for a MOOC or to come and study for your degree. Thank you very much indeed for joining us and we will say goodbye now to those of you online. Goodbye. <laughs>